Welcome to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, Paris Nice, the last pro bike race you'll see in some time. We have also got the Sheffield Magnificent Seven, but this week's racing news show is dominated by the news that there won't be much racing in the coming weeks and months. So let's start with what racing we did have. Paris Nice, the race to the sun, lived up to its name and reputation last week with seven days of absolutely brilliant racing. Many thought that the race shouldn't have gone ahead or at least continued to where it did, but organisers ASO managed to take it through to the penultimate day, albeit with a vastly reduced peloton. Stages two and three were battered by bad weather, crosswinds and crashes. Nari Quintana and Julian Alaphilippe had their GC hopes dashed by a crash and mechanical respectfully on stage two, which was won by a small group from Giacomo Nizzolo. That was Team NTT's sixth win of the year so far, just one short of their total tally from 2019. The following day's finish was also marred by this crash. Ball sits and waits on the wheel of Michael Matthews. Oh. Peter Sagan is crash. involved in this, a crash finish. on the left hand side. How Caleb Ewan held that up, I still do not know. Anyway, it put an end to his chances of a stage win. He and Hofstetter crossed the line relatively unscathed, while Sam Bennett was shepherded across the finish by his teammates, blood dripping from his hand. And to add to his injuries, the Irish champion was also fined 800 Swiss francs and docked 40 UCI ranking points that evening by the UCI for this manoeuvre in the closing kilometres with Nairo Quintana. Taking advantage of the melee behind him in the finishing straight was Ivan Garcia Cortina of Bahrain McLaren. He got the jump on everybody else, including Peter Sagan, who had to settle for second place on the day. The biggest win of the Spaniard's career, and you'd imagine the first of many. And so we moved on to the time trial. World hour record holder Victor Campanart shaved his beard off especially for it, although that didn't seem to help him too much on the day where he could only manage sixth place. The early pace on the stage was set by fellow Belgian Thomas de Ghent of Lotto Soudal, and here is his power, 425 watts average for just under 19 minutes according to his data on Strava. Still, in the end, it was only good enough for fourth place and somewhat surprisingly means that Thomas de Ghent has yet to win a time trial in his professional career. Which was also the case for Soren Crow Anderson of Team Sunweb until Thursday that was. He rode the time trial of his life to finish ahead of race leader Max Schachmann and compatriot Kasper Asgreen. That ride put Shackman in a very commanding position on the general classification, almost one minute clear of everybody else. Stage five was one of the most nail-biting finishes that I've seen in a long time. Behind, they are approaching. The sprint is starting, and it's going to be Barbier to have a go. Behind Michael Matthews trying to lead up Keir Spall as well. Tratnik's still going now. He can see the line. They can see him. It's 200 metres to go now for Tratnik. Oh, it's going to be so tense. It's going to be so tight. Bonnie Fletcher having a go on the right hand side, and it could well be heartbreak. Tratnik's there. Tratnik has his heart broken. It's Bonnie Fletcher to the line. Poor Jan Tratnik, away for over 225 kilometres and caught with 60 metres to go. I mean, he really deserved that one, didn't he? Although so too did Niccolo Bonifacio, who was head and shoulders above everybody else in that final sprint. That was the first World Tour win for his team, Total Direct Energy, since this race two years ago. That stage had yet more crashes and one of serious consequence for Mike Woods of EF Pro Cycling, who was taken to Lyon Hospital and diagnosed with a broken femur. We wish you all the best in your recovery, Mike. There was yet more drama on stage six, some of it before the stage even started. Bahrain McLaren decided not to start the stage due to the ongoing spread of COVID-19. And with a whole host of other rides also going home, it meant we were down to just 109 rides in the peloton at the start of the day. Race organizers ASO also announced that morning that the last stage would not take place and that the end of Paris Nice would be the finish line of stage seven. It didn't seem to take anything away from the racing though, in what was yet another gripping finale. Tish Benoit finished off some incredible work by his team Sunweb to take his first win for them and his third as a pro rider. Behind him though, the yellow jersey was in trouble. In the end, the German champion would cross the line 36 seconds behind Benoit to safely defend yellow, but he was subsequently awarded with the same time as the group of Michael Matthews, who came in 18 seconds before him, because the crash was inside the last three kilometers of the stage. A decision which left many scratching their heads. The incident was entirely Shackman's fault. Which leads us on to this week's poll over on the GCN app. 
Should you be given the same time as the group you're in if a crash in the last three kilometers was entirely your own fault? Yes or no? You'll be able to find a link to that poll on the screen right now. Speaking of which, last week's poll was also crash related and also in Paris-Nice. We asked you if a rider should be allowed to draft behind a team car after being involved in a crash. Here are the results. 58% of you saying yes, you should be able to. And so the final day and the only mountain of the race. A final opportunity then for Thomas de Ghent to do what he does best. He formed part of the early breakaway and then left everybody up the final climb, the Val de Blois La Colmiane, where he was cheered on by former teammate Victor Campanart, now with Team NTT. In the end, it wasn't to be. Even the power of de Ghent couldn't hold the pure climbs at bay. And it was some power. His normalized was 339 watts for close to five hours, according to Amati Pirali on Twitter. Although that was some way off his best, according to De Ghent himself on Twitter. So apparently back on the final stage of the 2017 World to Catalonia, he had a normalized power of 383 watts for three hours and 12 minutes. Incredible stuff. Anyway, back to the stage. Naira Quintana attacked with four kilometers to go in the big ring and was never seen again. Now, admittedly, he wasn't a threat on the general classification by that point, but I don't think anybody would have threatened him anyway. He came home over 40 seconds clear of everybody else to take his fifth win of the season so far for Arkea Samsic. Behind, Tish Benoit put in another solid ride to finish second, although it wasn't enough to prize the jersey away from Shackman, who held onto it by 18 seconds. Which, incidentally, was the exact amount of time he gained by being given the same time as the group he crashed out from the previous day. Anyway, you've got to say it was a very well-deserved overall win. He's the first rider to lead Paris from start to finish since his compatriot Jorg Yaksha did so back in 2004. And so he is this week's GCN Rider of the Week. Benoit finished second overall with the green points jersey, Igita third with the white jersey as best young rider, Nicholas Ede with the polka dot as best climber, and Team Sunweb with the team's classification. And that was the end of that for an indefinite period of time. We now head into the unknown, not just for cycling, but for the world in general. I shall stick to the cycling though, as we discuss the ramifications of the coronavirus on the 2020 season. Now the first implications that it had on pro cycling was at the UAE Tour, where the last two stages were canceled due to suspected positive cases. Now that was only two and a half weeks ago, but it feels like an eternity, doesn't it? In the last week, Fernando Gaviria, who was at that race, took to Instagram so that he has recovered from the virus, whilst teammate and lead out man Max Ricchesi also tested positive and remains in quarantine in Abu Dhabi. Since then, race after race has been cancelled or postponed. First, it was the Italian spring races. Then it was announced that all sports in Belgium would be cancelled until the 1st of April, taking out races such as Ghent Wevelgem and E3 plays. After that, it was the Bolte Catalunya, the Ronde van Drenthe, Grand Prix Dina, and then the biggest of all so far, the Giro d'Italia. Now, the first three stages had been due to take place in Hungary, a country which has declared a national state of emergency. I think we all expected it, I know I did, but it was still quite a shock to read their press release and see the news in black and white. That race goes beyond cycling. It's a national event, a national celebration. It's a race which transcends the sport and which has been run every year since World War II. You know that if there was any chance of that race going ahead as planned, it would have. Other races soon followed suit, even the women's tour, which has been due to take place here in the UK in June, three months away. Thus far, that is the most speculative cancellation of all and another indication of just how much this season could be affected. The Tour of Flanders, which did manage to continue through World War II, looks like it will have no option but to postpone this year's event. That was due to take place on the first weekend in April and you imagine that Paris-Roubaix will follow suit. And of course, it goes far beyond bike racing. TJ Van Garderen left Paris-Nice to head home to the US before it closed its borders to the incoming flights from Europe. Italy has been on lockdown with only pro riders able to go out on their bikes. This was the scene that greeted Jacopo Garnieri as he rode over the A1 Autostrada, which would normally be heaving. He said he felt like he was in a movie. Spain too has banned cycling and is handing out hefty fines for those silly enough to venture out regardless. Now let's be clear on this. The authorities are not worried that a rider out training will spread COVID-19. They're taking these measures to ensure that hospital beds and staff are not being used by someone who's fallen off their bike. 
As things stand, this looks like something that's going to get a hell of a lot worse before it gets better. It has put bike racing into perspective, but I don't think that means we can't be sad about missing out on bike races that we love. And so, here at GCN and GCN Racing, we'll be making as much cycling content as we can under the circumstances to help us all get through this difficult period. Right, let's finish this week's GCN Racing News Show with something a bit more positive. The 2020 Magnificent Seven did take place at the weekend. It's a 45 kilometer event with over 1200 meters of climbing. Now, rather than first across the line wins, this is an event where cumulative points across seven lines at the top of the steepest climbs that Sheffield has to offer decide the winners. In the men's, Ali Slater of Clancy Briggs Academy took the spoils at the first climb of the day, ahead of Kieran Savage, but those results were reversed on the second ascent of Waller Road. The third climb, Hag Hill, was the hardest of the day, Savage in more ways than one as Kieran again took maximum points. The fourth climb was a new addition to the event, Ivy Park, 800 meters, an average gradient of 13%. And by this point, Savage was flying, taking that one too and putting himself in a commanding position for the overall title. He didn't have it all his own way though. The fifth climb was Blake Street, the steepest in the area, and one that appears to suit Kieran Smith. He took that one last year and again this year. Savage was back to his winning ways on back lane, then second on the final climb of Burnt Hill, making him the comfortable winner of the event. The women rode the same seven climbs as the men, with Hannah Larbalestia, winner of the last two editions, starting as the big favourite. However, she faced strong opposition from brother UK rider Rebecca Richardson, who stormed up the first two climbs to take maximum points on each. In the end, she would win six of the seven climbs and therefore be crowned Queen of the Mountains for 2020. La Balestia would do enough to finish second on the day ahead of Hannah Bays. Right, that is all for this week's GCN Racing News Show. I'll be back next week with, um, well, I'll be back next week with a nice surprise, hopefully, for you all. I look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, stay safe, everybody. Bye for now. Cool. Thanks, Dan. Pleasure.